Um, we had the, the Dead Sea, I guess, known to everybody since it's just here, some meters uh, away. This was, this was the main discharge point of the groundwater system here in, here in Jordan. Because uh, the lowest point, on Earth, uh, um, accessible point on Earth, so water is going this way. Um, we also have, um, as an outflow, groundwater flows out into wadis, which then um, dewater into the Jordan Valley. And we have a lot of springs here at the outcropping areas, at the, at the um, escarpment of the, um, of the uh, Jordan Valley. Um, furthermore, we have the artificial outflow, which are basically here the, the pumping wells. There are about 5,000 um, known pumping wells here in Jordan, which have been, uh, as data was available, have been implemented into this one bottom model. Um, further on with the conceptualization, um, there are many geological um, units um, here in, in, um, in Jordan, starting with basalt layers on top. Um, they also extend into Syria. Um, then we have certain limestone sequences um, inter interfering with marl sequences. Um, and we got a lower lower sequence, which is basically marls and also sandstone. Um, we classified these units into um, hydrogeological um, units, um, identifying them as either um, aquifers, here highlighted in blue, or aquitards. Like the aquitards, they separate the aquifer store or the different aquifer layers um, hydraulically. And, and with this, we gathered or we made a simplification of the rather complex geological sequences here and their hydraulic behavior into two classes, aquitard and aquifer. We ended up with five aquifers, um, two upper limestone aquifer or basalt aquifer. Then the main target aquifer is the so-called A7B2. Um, this is the most prominent aquifer here in, in Jordan, which is also heavily exploited as the other two above. Below, a very thick aquitard, which is the A16 group, um, there are the the uh, sandstone aquifers, which are now um, successively exploited more and more, but um, they are at higher depths, so it's uh, more tricky to exploit them. So now coming briefly to the numerical setup itself, so we, we had defined on our, our model boundaries, um, we, um, we set up um, the two-dimensional bot flow grid. Um, we ended up with the three-dimensional setting, with the, as explained before. Um, with all these aquifers and aquitards, um, we introduced <coughs> hydraulic parameters as far as they were known, and we defined the boundary conditions uh, for inflow and outflow according to our conceptual understanding. And by this, ah, here's two, two images, right? Um, so this is how it looks like. On the right, on the left, you see um, a, a plain view on, on the groundwater model, or <laughs> basically on Jordan, which reflects the geological setting. Um, as it is, uh, as we can um, investigate it on the ground surface. So we've got a dark blue basalt layer on top of everything. Um, or yellow, or red, reddish, there's the P4, um, P4-5, also an aquifer type. And blue is the P3, which is a prominent aquitard. And the light green here, that's the A7-B2 outcropping here at the escarpment or at the, uh, the top of the escarpment here in Jordan. Uh, where there also recharge occurs, which is then flow, flowing basically either to watering into the into the Jordan Valley or um, um, flowing flowing towards um, the Aswan area. Um, below here in south to, to fill up, um, and that's the Ram Aquifer and, and Aquitides. Uh, hmm? Oh no, no, two more. Please. I have to hurry. Sorry. Um, okay, so on the setup, the calibration itself. So we. We aim to, to fit the calculated and the observed data. That's the, the, the thing to do with the, with the um, calibration. So if we achieve a good fit of the simulated data, simulated groundwater heads, um, compared to our observed data, then we can be conf um, confident that our model is reacting in, in the right manner. Um, same as the water balanced, what flows in has to flow out, so there must be no um, um, misbalance. What we encounter with the calibration is, I see some, show some slight spots um, for monitoring wells where we have observed data. The black dots are observed data, 
and the yellowish line is um, this is the model data. We encounter in many wells, we encounter a good fit in the early years. Like here in the beginning, we see the trend on um, how the groundwater levels are declining. Um, some they fit in later, but a certain point I want to address is that at the at later stage, we often recognize that there is suddenly a, a gap is, um, is um, prominent. And um, why this gap is there, um, we assume that the, the, the boundary data or the, the abstraction data which we had, which were available from the um, national uh, database, um, does not cover all the abstractions which are there in reality. So again, calibration we can draw these um, contour lines. We can analyze how groundwater levels have dropped from, for example, here from 1995 to 2017, and we we, we find a good a good accordance to the observed data. So this makes us confidence to use this model finally for uh, future predictions. So we set up two scenarios. One is the the scenario based on the available data from the groundwater database. Uh, with the production data from this database. The other scenario is we have done in the um, MWI by our colleague Ali Hanem, um, a remote sensing study um, assessing like um, what is the actual um, groundwater abstraction needed to produce all this, uh, to use, produce all these um, agricultural output um, which is actually there. And there's quite a difference. Sorry, on two slides, yes. Just get closer yeah. to the mic because I don't know the Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, so what we find out is when we compare these two scenarios, we see that the blue line is now, sorry for this, but the blue line is scenario one with the database um, assumptions. Um, we see that there's the gap compared to the black dots, which are the um, observed data. Scenario two, now the orange line, um, we see if we add these um, increased abstraction rates from the remote sensing study, um, we achieve in many places, especially in the areas where we have a high agricultural um, usage, we achieve a much better fit of our groundwater model and we can predict um, the, the trends which we observe to a better confidence. By this we are able to, again, forecast how the groundwater levels will um, develop in future. For example, comparing these two scenarios um, until, for, until 2050, for example, we see like using the database data, um, we end up with drawdowns up to 50 meter. Here's a problem well field there it's higher and comparable. Um, if we use the actual abstractions given by remote sensing data, um, we see that these uh, the drawdowns um, will evolve to much, much uh, more significance and um, to higher depths up to 100 meter. So and these drawdown areas that coincide very well with the agricultural, highly intensively used areas. It's almost done, sorry. Um, <laughs> I hope it's interesting for you, but when, when we use, what can we do with the, with, the, with the model itself? We can predict the future, we can see drawdowns, etc. Um, many people say then, from decision-making point of view, hey, what, what does it tell us? What is 100 meter work, or what does it mean to us? So, what we can give um, these decision makers into their hands is, for example, we can analyze, if we look at the blue dots, these are productive wells in 2017, and we can see like, okay, some wells, as far as we have information about their depth, we can analyze whether they be productive or will they fall dry. So, looking at 2050, the situation becomes even uh, obviously more severe. Now it's, this shows people or decision makers, okay, what, what is, what is the consequence of these groundwater abstractions? Um, furthermore, we have the possibility to, um, to to sum up the abstraction volumes, for example, on a nationwide level. We can see, like when we are here at today, 2017, if we would pump the same same amount of water, like in this business as usual scenario, we would still end up with um, with a decline of abstraction because the wells are falling dry. So there is a lack, a certain additional lack of um, available, broadwater available, availability. Um, almost, almost done. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I just always miss the, the buttons, the right ones. <laughs> so what we can also see is like by falling groundwater levels, we are able to, um, to identify the costs of pumping. So if we just look at the pump lift cost, 
problem with, uh, which increases by uh, pumping water from a greater depth to, uh, to the surface. So this will, there will be increases of up to 20-30% maybe, and by this I will come to the end and um, yeah, I will sum up. So we have this groundwater model, it is in place, it is working, we are confident that it is, uh, reproduces the, the flow processes within Jordan. Um, the consequences of these groundwater level decline is A, a reduced groundwater availability, B, an increased number of falling dry wells, and C, also like an increased um, production cost in the future. So these things to keep in mind. And last but not least, we will couple it to a weed model to have a decision support system um, for all of the Thanks for your patience. Thank you very much for very interesting and the, the 3D modeling aspect. Um, thank you to uh, Mark Ropius and also to Dr. Mona Dahbiye, from who is head of the modeling department at the Ministry of Water and Irrigation um, here in Jordan um, and is also a geologist. So we're coming to our last speaker um, from Oman, uh, Dr. Mohammed Al Karbani. Uh, Karbani uh, is a PhD in um, environmental sustainability from the University of, Ar of Aberdeen in the United Kingdom. He worked as a research assistant at the Sultan Qaboos University and then at the Ministry of Environment and Climate Affairs in Oman. Oman is the only one in the region that has actually a ministry dedicated in their title to environment and climate change in the title, which is um, quite impressive. And um, he has worked as Director of Environment and Sustainable Development there. He has, been particip he has participated in many research projects related, related to environmental water resource management and nature conservation and has presented various papers. Uh, he currently serves also as a member of different societies, including the Oman Water Society. And he'll be sharing with us today a presentation on sustainable water management of water scarcity in arid mountains, uh, a case study of the beautiful Al Jabal Al Akhta in Oman. Peace. Thanks, uh, Carol. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, actually, today I'm presenting uh, Environment Society of Oman. This is the the logo of the Environment Society of Oman. And this is actually what I am presenting today is very comprehensive study and, and research. And this was, so this is a research, typically a research project. But uh, I actually I will try just in 15 minutes to shed light on just very uh, common uh, findings from this research project. And, uh, and then uh, finally I will just uh, put some points uh, forward for your uh, to take home. So, uh, before actually as introductory, general introductory to the, to the, to the topic, uh, and actually this is the first uh, paper in this, in this conference actually, as far as I attended other sessions, I haven't seen any, any paper or any presentation focusing on mountains. So this is good also actually to highlight what is Hawaii focusing on the mountains and as you know, actually, mountains is occupying about one quarter of, uh, of the world's land surface area. So it's very important ecosystems, uh, providing good and surfaces for more than half of the world population. And actually, uh, as you know, <coughs> most of the waters come from uh, mountains. So they, they, they I mean, uh, call it uh, water towers because they actually provides most of the waters, so more than half of the humanities relies on fresh waters and about 60 to 80 percent of this fresh water in the world comes from the mountains. Uh, focusing on the arid regions, as you know, I mean, mountains are the only areas okay, with sufficient precipitations compared to the lowland areas where, where the precipitations not uh, exceeding actually 75 or, uh, millimeters annually. And uh, also, uh, mountains account for more than 50 to 90 percent of the total discharge in arid areas. And uh, also, since actually uh, we are talking about the high uh, above uh, sea levels, so the evapotranspirations in the mountains are very low compared to the uh, to the lowland plants. So this is the actually just general introduction about the mountains and uh, I will go directly to uh, my, uh, uh, my project. So my project actually focusing on uh, uh, an area called the Jabal Akhtar. Okay, and, and the translation is Green Mountain. So it is, uh, as you know, Oman is located in one of the Gulf countries in the Arabian Peninsula. 
So I mean, uh, talking about mountains, mountains covers in the southern and, 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 and northern uh, of the Oman. And uh, my study area actually is, is in the center part of the northern uh, Oman mountains. It is here. And it is uh, up to 3,000 meters above sea level. Uh, by the way, Oman actually has, uh, I mean, the mountains cover around 20% of the total uh, area. And looking to the uh, temperature uh, in this region or in this, uh, in this area, actually the temperatures are 12 degrees centigrade lower than the lowland. Okay, and the uh, rainfall is around 250 to 400 millimeters annually. And that is compared to, you can see, I mean, the borders of mountains here is uh, receiving high precipitation compared to the lowlands where, where, where uh, in Oman we don't have more than actually 50 or to 75 millimeters annually. Okay. Uh, there are actually many, many rapid uh, social developments in the, in the mountains and especially when talking about the populations. The population actually increased since the 1970s by more than 200%, and also the households and the housing units also increased more than 100% since the last census, actually this data from 2010. Uh, the main activities actually in this area is, is agriculture, and uh, where more than 70% of the inhabitants actually rely on wood, on agriculture, and where farmers actually grow pomegranates and roses. So pomegranates covers around more than uh, more than sorry uh, pomegranates covers more than uh, sixty five percent of the uh, of the total crop uh, grown in the in the areas and uh, followed by fourteen percent actually by roses where actually uh, farmers uh, use those roses actually to extract it and uh, produce uh, very valuable uh, water extraction uh, process. I mean, and this is very very unique uh, products in this in this area. Uh, in addition, actually, to the pomegranate and roses, also farmers also rely on uh, keeping uh, uh, animals, especially goats, which represents more than 80 percent of the total animal units in the area. And, uh, but unfortunately, actually, they, they use traditional 